Hej allihopa och välkommen till Pengaflödepodcasten. Mitt namn är Emily. Och mitt namn är Anna. Vi håller på med fastighetsinvesteringar i Storbritannien. Och den här podden kommer handla om just detta och vi kommer varje vecka att ta upp relevanta ämnen och intervjua personer som vi finner inspirerande. Hej och välkomna till Pengaflödepodcasten. Today we have Natasha. Or should I call you the BRR queen? <laughs> oh, I like that. Let's go with the BRR queen. <laughs> <laughs> How is life? Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on your podcast. I'm really excited. So what have you been up to? Um, well, it's been a challenge in two weeks because I came back from uh, Spain. So just before they announced um, the changes in the quarantine rules, I was at Heathrow ready to fly out. So yeah, I've been quarantining for the last sort of, 10 days, um, but making the most of it, doing lots of Zoom calls and podcast interviews. And yeah, all good. What about you? How are you? I'm all right. Sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what, how, I don't know what the weather is in uh, where are you based? Uh, Peterborough. Peterborough, yeah. That's true. Yeah. It's currently checking it down with the rain, but we have had yeah, a lot of humidity and heat over the last few days, so it's quite nice. Yeah. No, so I, I wanted you to join the podcast because I've I've seen your journey since uh, last year when you started with property. And you've done a lot of uh, BRR. So that's why I mentioned that you were the BRR queen. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's you and Tej that are accelerating with the BRR. Oh, so can he see. can be the king and I'll be the queen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I thought this podcast will be, will be very interesting. So could you just tell us about your background? Yeah, of course. Um, so I worked for a high street bank for 11 years prior to getting into property. Um, did numerous roles from, I started out from cashiering to became a branch manager. And then I did my CMAP qualifications to become a mortgage advisor, which I'd done for three years. Um, but I always wanted my own business. Didn't have a clue what I wanted to do, but what, I was one of those people that loved watching like Homes Under the Hammers and really interested in property, which I think was one of the reasons why I got into mortgages and being a mortgage advisor. Um, and then I discovered one of Rob Moore's books, which it was The 44 Secrets to Property Investing. Um, and that sort of blew my mind a bit because as a mortgage advisor, it's very different to being a mortgage broker. Um, The only way I thought people built a property portfolio was to have a really good job or good good business, make a lot of money, save up to get a deposit and then um, buy a property and then do it again. So that would have taken me years and years and years of saving to get a deposit together. Um, so when I figured, when I read Rob Moore's book and realized how you can actually do it using the buy refurbish refinance model and working with investors, That was just like a light bulb switch went on in my brain and I was like, that's what I want to do. That's what I, yeah, I'm really interested in. And then I became obsessed with it and learning about it and listening to all the podcasts and doing all the free webinars and finally took the leap to doing some paid training and education in March last year. So I'd done their masterclass, which is a four day property training event all around sort of buy to lets and buy refurbishing refinancing properties and then I went on to join their master their mentorship program which is a 12 month VIP program in May so are you financial free already yeah so I gave myself 12 months to replace my um my income from my job so I took a year career break to really focus on property and gave myself 12 months to replace my income, which I did. So I officially handed in my res resignation in December, just gone, so December 2019. Well done, well done. 
Thank you. The, the, I don't know if I'm financially free. I think it depends what people's opinion is on that. I'm not financially free that I can go and travel the world completely and have no sort of need to increase my income. But I've managed to yeah, replace my job income through the buy to let's probably almost trebled it now with the other properties that we've got as well. And you did all of this in one year? Yeah, so I replaced my job income in, in 12 months, less than 12 months really, because I start, yeah, about nine months. Wow, that's amazing. So, <laughs> so why, why buy to let? Um, so I think it comes down to why I wanted to get into property really. It is for the freedom and I think buy to let is one of the most passive property strategies out there. I know you can outsource a lot now and systemize a lot, um, but I wanted yeah, something quite passive, something quite simple and straightforward, and also an asset-based portfolio, so not just rent to rents or, um, yeah, or deal sourcing or whatever. I wanted to create a portfolio that I can leave as a legacy to, to my family. I understand. So how big is your portfolio then? Um, so we've just exchanged on our ninth property. We've got our 10th and 11th going through conveyancing at the minute, which takes it up to about 1.5 million pounds. Um, and then we've also just taken on our fourth went to rent service accommodation property. So I do a little bit of service accommodation, but my main focus is on um, single lets, buying, refurbishing, and refinancing. So then my second question is, how do you get investors? Um, I mean, it, it's hard when you're starting out, definitely. You've got to build relationships with people. It's hard for someone to just invest in you without you having any experience or um, any sort of proof of, of what you can do. So I think... For me, I spent quite a bit of time networking and I did a lot of business networking, not property networking. I love property networking because I love being able to go there and just talk to people about property and um, the ups and downs that you have and sort of share your challenges. But I found that when you went to a property networking event, most people were there for the same things, which was to find investors or to find deals. So I spent a lot of my time networking in sort of business environments, um, doing quite a bit on social media. I'm not as active as what I was at the beginning, but I think having social proof and being able to share your knowledge and what you've learned through your education and your training really helps. I mean, you can find them anywhere and everywhere. I think the strangest place I've found an investor is in the sauna of our gym. <laughs> In, <laughs> in Peterborough. So it's quite quite a high sort of class gym. Um, it's a, da a David Lloyd club. And yeah, just chatting to people, just literally telling everyone what you do and how you can help them. Um, I think focusing on how you can help them more than how, why you need money really helps as well. So you, you can help them get much better returns on their money than what they would get sat in the bank on a hands-free basis through property using a secured asset. So I think that the main goal is to attract investors to you, which we're now at the point where we are attracting investors to us. So they're actually coming to us and asking for an initial discussion or asking for more information about investing with us. But when you're first starting out, it is just getting yourself out there, telling literally everyone what you do, how you can help them and being in the right sort of networks and environments um, of sort of high net worth individuals or sophisticated investors. So, so you mentioned you went to a expensive gym or high-end high gym. So did you try to be around like where high net worth people are? And through that, you started to pitch what you do and then they started to follow your journey or yeah just I mean I was already a member of the gym but just being there as a sort of property investor and speaking to people about what you do because they'd start to notice you're there where most people are at their nine-to-five jobs you're at the gym or you're 
in the sauna and you just sort of have a conversation because that's not what most people do that most people are there in the evenings so yeah I think just yeah networking with the right type of people and being in the right sort of circles and environments definitely helps um, so but, then I have a follow-up question about that what do you think is the most difficult or challenging with the uh, new investors when you approach them? Um, I don't, I, I haven't really gone to an investor and pitched to them before. I mean, I use a, I go to a, a business networking event, which is a referral based networking event and you pitch to the room. So in our chapter, there's 55 members and you pitch to your room how you can help um, investors or you're looking for deals whatever um, but they generally have their contacts that they then refer to you so I've never actually directly pitched to an investor before um, when I was starting out I sent like investor packs to friends and family and just asked for their opinion and their feedback never directly gone out there and actually asked for the money um, apart from actually tell a lie in Progressive, they do a deal clinic where you can stand on stage and pitch your deal. And I've done that a couple of times, but that is to a room full of property investors. Um, and they're fully aware of that pitch is happening during that day. So, yeah. So, so uh, the way forward then uh, that you mean that when people like put on their post, on a Facebook post uh, asking for money, that's not the way to go, do you think? That's not the way I've done it. No, I've focused more on um, building relationships with people. I mean, I'm sure some people have had success from doing posts on Facebook, but I don't really feel comfortable doing that myself. I'd rather focus on actually building relationships with people rather than just asking, asking for the money. Um, I know there's, there's threads in different property communities that you can post on but yeah I don't know I just uh, it's probably a British thing I don't feel very comfortable asking for money outright I would rather um, yeah, build relationships with people and then say how we can help them their money sat in the bank earning absolute peanuts now how we can help them and give them a better lifestyle or a better retirement or nicer holidays um, I like to focus more on the relation side and yeah, how we, how we help them and solve their problems and their pain points. Would you like to have like a pool of investors or are you more focused on having like four or five and then you just recycle the money all the time with those and building the relationship with those or do you want to have a pool of investors? What's it take? Yeah, I prefer to have like four or five and generally one investor to fund a purchase of the property because then they can have the first charge. Um, and most investors, once you've completed a project with them, they're happy to go again. If And sometimes they'll give you even more money so you've got an even bigger pot to work with. Um, a lot of investors like to test you out first and just use a smaller amount. Um, but yeah, my preference is to, to have smaller a smaller pot of investors. I think like probably six would be at absolute maximum at one point of time, just because the relationship is really important to me. Like I like to speak to them on a regular basis and, and build a, a strong working and business relationship with them. Um, maybe if we got into bigger developments and needing larger pots of funding, then yeah, we'd look at, multiple investors um, but to enable them to have the first charge and the best security that they can have I prefer to work with one investor per property and per project yeah that's good that's very sensible of you so could you explain BRR for the people that don't don't know uh, the listeners yeah please? of course so it's like a, a a business model really that you can use for any um, 
property strategy. So you could use buy, refurbish, refinance for serviced accommodation or for HMOs or for single lets like we do. All it means is that you're buying property at a discount. So generally we buy from motivated sellers who are more concerned about having a quick guaranteed sale than getting an extra 10, 15 grand for their property. So we buy at a discount and then we'll add value to the property. And that's really important to ensure that we can get the uplift when it comes to refinancing. So we can add value either just through a simple cosmetic refurbishment if you've got a good enough discount, or you can do a garage conversion, loft conversion, an extension, reconfiguring the property. There's loads and loads of different ways that you can add value, but you've just got to ensure that the discount that you get and the amount of value you can add will then allow you to um, refinance and pull out most, if not all of your money at that stage. Um, and then obviously we rent the property out and benefit from the monthly cash flow. Great explanation. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you use your investors' money to purchase and refinance? Like if you could go through us the, the process? Yeah, of course. So we prefer to uh, purchase property cash with investor finance. Um, like I said already, that means they can have the first charge on the property and that just gives them a lot of security and a lot of um, puts them at, at ease dealing with us, especially if it's the first uh, project we're doing together. So we purchase the property cash if possible. If not, then we would use their deposit with bridging finance and find a lender that enables that allows the investor to take the second charge of the property because not all lenders will also would use their deposit with bridging finance. You can't use an investor's deposit with a mortgage. Mortgage lenders just don't like it because they deem it to be 100% lending. Um, yeah, so we'll purchase property cash, complete the refurbishment, which generally we now pay for, pay for. So our company will cover the cost of the refurbishment. The investor is just paying for the purchase of the property. And then we will refinance. So there's an unspoken rule that you have to wait six months before refinancing, but we don't generally do that. There's about four or five lenders, or this was pre-corona, there's about four or five lenders that would lend before the six months and they would lend on the uplift in value that you've created. So the actual true market value of the property, not just the purchase price plus what you've spent. So generally our refurbs take sort of six to eight weeks and we'll start the refinance stage at around week four. So then the valuation is ready to be done once the refurbishment's complete. So we'll get the valuation done, um, go through all the, the legal side of registering the mortgage charge, pay our investors back and we keep the property and rent it out. Quite good system. You... <laughs> Yeah, it, make, it makes it a lot easier if you can buy with cash. I mean, bridging finance is great. And if the deal's amazing, then it's, it's fine using bridging finance. But if it's quite a tight deal, you don't really want to be paying investor interest plus all the bridging interest and the fees. Um, because the fees involved are, are quite costly on bridging finance, which is why we prefer to buy cash. And it also enables us to complete quicker and have more power when negotiating on the deal yeah so what are the pros and cons when borrowing in your personal name instead of in your company name um so with borrowing your interest rates are slightly higher when but when you buy in a limited company so the mortgage rates will be lower if you buy in your personal name but then you can't offset mortgage interest in your personal name like you can through a limited company. So because of section 24, um, yeah, you can no longer offset the mortgage interest against the rental income. So your rental income is deemed as the whole rental income. Um, so it's more just sort of tax benefits really of having it in a company. We've got a couple in our personal name. Um, just when we started out, we probably weren't educated enough um, and didn't get the correct advice from accountants. Um, but now we buy everything through our limited company. What does the lender say when it's investor money you're purchasing it with? 
Um, so like I said, you can't use investor money to purchase with a, a mortgage. You can use it with bridge and finance. And generally they're fine. They just need to see source of funds to adhere to all their anti-money laundering um, requirements. So that's something we get up front from investors before going any further. We'll get their source of funds and proof of funds and identification. Um, when you come to refinance, I've never had any issues refinancing it because we've bought it with investor finance. Um, yeah, they've never really, really questioned it. I think mainstream lenders like your high street banks might be more um, concerned around it, but when you get to more the sort of specialist limited company buy to let mortgages, they're, I think they're quite clued up around how investors work. So, so they are more, they don't function as the traditional banks. They're more investor friendly, the buy to let mortgages and, and then, am I, am I correct? Yeah, definitely. Because I was a, a mortgage advisor for a high street bank and their lending policy was really strict. Um, so they wouldn't have liked that at all. But if you're looking at, we mainly use sort of Paragon, Precise, um, Nottingham Building Society, the sort of non-mainstream lenders. I've not had any issues with refinancing properties that were bought with investor cash. What surprises did occur that was not mentioned on your property training? Ooh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> um, I mean, I, th I think they don't really cover off a lot of the investor side and how it all works with them and registering the first charge. I mean, they explain what you can offer as security and the legal documents, but it's sort of a case of teaching yourself or educating yourself by working with good solicitors um, to establish how it act actually works. And they don't explain how things how much things cost like registering a first charge or doing your personal guarantees for the mortgage lender um there's quite a few hidden costs that aren't necessarily covered during your property training um but the main things probably is just sort of your mindset and how you can ensure you are successful and you you do keep going and you keep taking action because at the beginning it can be quite disheartening. You've got no relationships with agents. You don't have the experience of negotiating on um, offers or you don't have any investors lined up. So yeah, I think the biggest challenge and probably shock for me was your mindset around it all. And it's a very much, a, I say it's a roller coaster ride being a property investor. There's so many highs and lows, so many things that can go wrong. But then you get such a buzz when you get a deal over the line or you onboard a new investor. Um, yeah, I think there could be quite a lot covered off around sort of your mindset, motivation, and keeping you on track. But then I think that also comes down to your personality and maybe having a mentor mentor or an accountability group or a mastermind something like that to keep you on track yeah that that's the i agree with that with the property training that they leave out some parts and i don't know if it's because they can't cover everything <laughs> or yeah. if it's uh, like you say yeah, I mean, I think they're quite careful around covering off like legal documentation in case there was any issues and they don't want to sort of put themselves in a position where they could have caused a problem in someone's property journey. Um, but I do think it's a lot that you need to know. And the other thing is health and safety. Um, if you are, even if you're refurbishing your own property, if you've got more than two contractors involved, you are responsible for their health and safety unless you've got a principal designer or, and a principal contractor, um, like a builder managing all of that. So that's something that's not covered off at all. 
and I think it was up until sort of our fifth purchase, I didn't even realise the responsibility that we had for our contractors' health and safety, because we've never used a builder. We've always project managed ourselves and appointed contractors to complete um, different aspects of the refurbishment or the conversion. Um, so yeah, that's definitely missed off. Um, and some people were completely oblivious to it as I was really good advice and that that leads me into this question what should you think of when doing bro oh my gosh everything <laughs> um so you've got to obviously first and foremost establish your gold mine area and make sure you're buying in the right property and in the right area and buying the right types of properties um, you need to have sort of good solid comparables or good knowledge of the area, what the property is going to value at, what it's going to rent out at. Um, you need to have spoken to a mortgage advisor to make sure the property is mortgage mortgageable. I think it's so important that you make sure your exit strategy is going to be able to um, go ahead. So if you are buying, refurbishing, refinancing, you need to ensure you can refinance that property before you commit to buy it. Um, and there's lots and lots of different reasons why properties can be deemed unmortgageable um, by different lenders. And you might have an issue being able to pull all the money back out if the rental income isn't high enough because they now do stress tests on the rental income. Um, there's, there's just so much you need to know. <laughs> you need to know about working with investors, how you can ensure that their money's secure. You need to ensure you've got a good estimate for your refurbishment. So obviously you're never going to know exactly what your refurb is going to cost, but you can get a good estimation and you can include a contingency to cover you if things are to go wrong. Um, so yeah, you need to then have a schedule of works drawn up before you complete on the property build relationships and get recommendations and connections with contractors and builders, um, find yourself a good letting agent. There's, there's a lot involved. It's hard to, <laughs> hard to cover that off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But if it's just one, okay, let's say like this, if we can give three tips that are vital. Okay. Uh, I'd say know your area, know it inside out. Number one, uh, get a good mortgage broker and build a good relationship with them. So a lot of people quibble about paying mortgage broker fees, trying to go direct to the lender themselves, but a good mortgage broker is worth their weight in gold. And number three, get recommendations for, like if you're starting out get recommendations for contractors and builders because there's so many people out there who are sort of cowboy builders cowboy contractors you want a recommendation <laughs> someone that you know or trust um if you're new to the game and you've not worked with with them before when you're new to that area it can uh, cause a lot of issues if you don't have the right contractors and builders in place definitely there's three that I could probably do 300. But. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. That's great. <laughs> so what cost should you factor in when doing BRR? Oh, gosh. Um, so costs, you'll have obviously your legal fees, including your searches. If you're going to do your searches, sometimes we pay for an indemnity policy to indemnify against the searches if we need to complete quick. Um, but that's your legal costs, probably anywhere between 800 to 1500 pounds, depending on where you are and whether you're buying in a limited company, buying with a mortgage. If you're buying with Bridge and Finance, it'll be a bit, quite a bit more, probably over the two grand mark. So you've got your legal fees, obviously your stamp duty, which if it's below 500,000 pounds, that's going to be 3% of the purchase price. You've then got your survey costs. If you want to have a survey evaluation done, you can have a home buyer's report. Um, you've got mortgage broker fees. Um, you've got, 
obviously your fees of holding the, the property whilst you're refurbishing. So most councils will make you still pay council tax. You put your utilities, water, whilst you're holding the property until you get a tenant moved in. Um, you've got costs with letting agents, finding the letting agents. You've got legal costs when you refinance. If you're buying in a limited company, the lender will ask for personal guarantees. So all directors of the property will have to give a personal guarantee and seek independent legal advice, which is generally around £250 plus VAT per director. So that can be quite costly. Um, You've got obviously all the re refurbishment costs, costs to get the property cleaned after. Um, just trying to think what else I've missed. You've got arrangement fees on some mortgage products. They have arrangement fees on top. Uh, the refinancing, you have to pay for the legals again for that. There's quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's most of them. Yeah, it's, it sounds like you got most of them, yeah. How can you do the BRR efficiently? Um, so you've got to obviously make sure you buy the property at the right price, first and foremost. You need to be buying the property at a right price where you can create enough, enough uplift to be able to refinance. We're quite comfortable leaving in sort of five to ten thousand pounds maximum per property, um, as long as yeah the rental income sort of covers repays what any money's left in over the next two years. That's our sort of main target that we focus on. If we do leave any have to leave any money in, um, obviously you do get some unicorn amazing deals where you can pull all your money back out if not more than what you've actually put in and invested in which is amazing but they, they don't come around very often um sorry i've completely forgot what the question actually was <laughs> 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 you get too excited about the memo deals <laughs> <laughs> and for listeners it it means money in money out uh, yeah i i ask how can you do it efficiently the BRR model okay um you need to make sure that your refurbishment is an accurate estimate um so when I was starting out I'd get sort of contractors to give me quotes just based on measurements that I've taken or sort of figuring out what a rewire would be on a three-bed property it does take a bit of time you need to research you need to reach out to contractors and establish what the costings are in your area um, or you can pay sort of a builder to come on give him some money for an hour of his time and give you a full breakdown of of a quote what it would be to complete all the works but that's really important because a lot of people overestimate and then that prevents them from getting the deal um, i think you need to make sure it's a an accurate estimate and we can include 20% contingency just to cover um, if anything goes wrong. Like you never know when you start ripping the, the property out and taking the bathroom out, it might need to be fully re, replumbed, which wasn't obviously visible through when you did your, your viewings and your um, schedule of works and refurb estimates. So that's really important and yeah you need to have a good marketing plan to to find these deals in the first place so whether that's building relationships with agents or getting direct to vendor through leafleting um direct mail letters billboards advertising in magazines shops or doing facebook ads um it's going to be really hard to just find a brr deal scrolling through right move um because they're not really visible on there. You need to be building the relationships with the right people and the right agents. Um, and yeah, have a, have a marketing plan or marketing strategy to, to get direct to vendor because that's where you're going to find your best deals. Where have, have you seen uh, your most success rate with the marketing when you direct to vendor? Uh, yeah. Um, or 
agents or yeah most of our deals have come through agents um i've got some really good relationships with probably three now but really good relationships where i know they will bring the first deals to us you need to only probably have good relationships with a couple obviously i know most of the agents in peterborough but i've got really good strong relationships with three estate agents um so most of our deals come through them but we've also had um two deals from direct mail letters i've done quite a bit of leafleting but if i'm honest i haven't had a great deal of success from it but i've probably not done it as consistently and regularly as possible as you should do because i've not seen the rewards from doing it um, and we're just launching a new facebook ad campaign as well um, but yeah, ours is mainly agents and direct mail letters. I think nowadays when people receive a handwritten letter, they're, they're going to be curious. You do not get many of them at all. Um, so it really sort of attracts their attention rather than a leaflet that just goes through with a few other leaflets and they're used to throwing it straight in the bin. Um, a direct mail, they, they generally do read and... Um, it attracts their attention when it lands on their on their doorstep. <laughs> I I can just imagine it's like you're saying, people don't handwrite anymore, email or texting or brochures like you mentioned. Yeah. So what's your take on BRR moving forward now when we're in this climate that we're in? Um, I think there's going to be some amazing opportunities coming up. I mean, now we're officially in a recession. Um, I think it's going to create a lot of nervousness and uncertainty and worry in uh, vendors. So it's going to be a great time for putting in um, some low offers that work for you and also using that as negotiation power. Like we we're pretty certain we're going to have a, a housing market crash. We're due a correction anyway. We're in a recession. Um, it just helps. I always like to justify why my offer is my offer. And having the fact that we are now in a recession and the Bank of England are expecting um, a housing um, crash, then it just helps sort of justify why my offer is my offer. I don't like to just put low it offers in and not explain why my offer is my offer um so yeah I, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity there's obviously going to be a lot of job losses which will in turn create repossessions um i think there's going to be higher divorce rates there's going to be obviously unfortunately more probate properties coming on um, which one of my agents said he's getting quite a few at the minute. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And I think it, for people that are buying to hold property, it's going to be a fantastic time in the next sort of 12 months um, to find some deals which are going to be absolute bargains when you look back at it in a couple of years' time. So no flips for you then, right? We do a couple of flips, yeah, and I'm quite comfortable doing a flip as long as I can still refinance it. So if worst cases, house prices do drop, um, as long as I can refinance it and get most of the investors' money back out, um, I'm quite comfortable to still do that and hold it for a short period of time before we sell. Uh, but yeah, I, like, I do like to buy and hold. That is sort of our main focus. Have, have you seen uh, these type of uh, contracts from the councils and etc have have that increased or do you think it will increase now when we're in official recession sorry what do you mean contracts with the council yes yes what type what do you mean? Like, how, oh, have, having um, benefit tenants? Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, we, I know you're not meant to sort of discriminate anymore, 
we don't have none of our properties are rented to people on housing benefits um, or universal credits as it's known now I think I, I mean I think it, they were probably the people that didn't have any issues during the lockdown and, and the coronavirus because the council will always pay their rent um, but yeah I mean I know there's a shortage of 300 300 families are currently in emergency accommodation in Peterborough because the council haven't got housing for them. So they're in Airbnbs or um, like HMO rooms. So there's a, a lot of, wow. yeah, there's a lot of sort of demand for um, rental properties. And I think, like you said, that, that will increase. So the rental side, I don't think there's going to be any issues with finding tenants if people are having their house repossessed they're going to have to rent they're not going to be able to buy for quite a few years um but yeah i don't i don't really know a lot about housing benefit tenants because that's not sort of our tenant type okay fair enough fair enough <laughs> so what's next moving forward for you um, so continuing with the, the buy, refurbish, refinance, my aim is to sort of get 30 under our belt before I do anything else. Um, so the, the aim is 100 before I'm 40, which is nine and a, wow. half, <laughs> nine and a half years away, um, which I think is achievable doing the rate that we're doing. And it obviously snowballs once you can... Um, refinance your properties again in sort of five, six years time, pull more, more equity back out. Um, but I would like to get into developments um, in a couple of years time, I think sort of commercial to residential or developing like a, an office into flats, something like that, but I'm not hundred percent sure yet. It would still be on like a, a buy, refurbish, refinance sort of model and a single let basis. Um, but yeah, I'm just happy doing what I'm doing now and I've st started a mentorship program myself. So I'm helping people who are literally just getting started or trying to scale their, their buy, refurbish, refinance portfolio a lot quicker. So I'm really enjoying that. And I think being in, in property, it does create a lot of opportunities, whether that be going into training and mentorship or um, helping and supporting other people with their business. Um, yeah, so just in, enjoying the journey now, I think at the minute now I've got a bit more financial freedom and a bit more time under my belt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have come to the fun part. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite movie? TV series or Netflix series or, yeah, HBO, <laughs> books. Is this, is this property related or just anything? You can say both if you like. Okay, so my my current favourite Netflix series is sort of property related, but it's real, like, real trashy TV. And it's probably one for the women out there. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> Called Selling Sunset. Um, and yeah, they, yeah, yeah. I've heard about it. Is it good? It, it's real trashy TV, but <laughs> they show you some beautiful properties, and it's just amazing, like seeing how how the sort of process works in America, and the amount of commission that they can earn on these properties. Like, it is amazing. Um, but yeah, it's real a real trashy TV program. Where all the girls are all, all fighting, but I like to look at their shoes and their outfits and their houses. <laughs> A bit like Geordie Shore. <laughs> Not that bad. <laughs> it's, more, it's probably more like uh, the Kardashians or something like that, but there's an element of property involved. <laughs> uh, books, my favourite sort of business property books got me rich dad poor dad because that was just amazing and I made my dad read it after I read it 
because he's one of those that you study really hard, you go to university, you get a degree, and you, <laughs> you get were like, a job. In your face, Dad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, bless him. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was it's just put in real simple terms as sort of the difference and the way different people think and what makes you sort of an entrepreneur and a a successful person versus working hard for somebody else's company and making them lots of money. Uh, yeah, so that's definitely an all-time favourite. Um, I only really read sort of business and property-related books or educational books. I, I've not read a fictional book since I did my A-levels. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same. <laughs> I just read uh, motivation and education and property books. Yeah. Or yeah. listen to it. Yeah, even better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what about movie then? Uh, oh, probably my all-time favorite movie has got to be Dirty Dancing. <laughs> it seems like every female like that movie. <laughs> like a hope romantic uh female classic yeah i've probably watched it about 20 million times or or pretty women i love that too <laughs> <laughs> i'm not surprised <laughs> <laughs> so how can people get a hold of you um so i'm on sort of facebook instagram linkedin uh yeah they're probably the best ways facebook's easier uh comes through to obviously messenger and doesn't get missed then um because i've got a va who deals with my instagram side of social media and all the messages on there so yeah facebook is probably best yeah but this has been a pleasure speaking with you and giving uh, all of the tips about brr so no. I hope I hope the listeners uh, have taken some notes so they can <laughs> go out and do it themselves. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you so much for having me on. It was good fun. It was, it was. And when I next time when I come to Peterborough, I will definitely like to meet you and in, in person. <laughs> for sure, we'll have a coffee and talk property. Yeah, definitely. Okay then, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Don't be stressed. Invest people. <laughs> <laughs>